Good morning, One Turner Church family. You're allowed to say good morning. <laughs> good morning to most of us who are watching online right now. We have some of us here at church. There is a limit of 30. Um, so the worship participants and some of their family is here. But Dan and I, we consulted with the elders. Um, we thought we could uh, round out the 30 or come close to it by tapping a handful of people on the shoulder. So those who have had limited access to the internet, if you've kind of lived by yourself, um, and so we have this. Now, in case you miss Julie's Living His Love Church Community segment, um, our church service next week will be an online service. It's the regional. There is a typo that I, that I was pointed out to me. Uh, it's not November 21st, because that's a Sunday. It's November 20th. Um, there is no co correlation with how we're talking about the Mark of the Beast. It's no, it's, it's November 20th. Um, Sabbath schools will run as usual. Links will be in the newsletter. You won't see us here from church. You will uh, be hearing from, as Julie mentioned, Pastor Jet Terry Johnson, who is the new president of the Australian Union Conference. So that is next week, November 20th. Tune in via Facebook um, and also via our website and YouTube. Now, the following week, we should have information on what things look like. Our roadmap will be revealed to us, I suppose, um, and we will most likely have a town hall meeting uh, on November 25th with an imminent return to church in some way, shape, or form, uh, maybe November 27th, but realistically, probably December 4th. All right, so just keep an eye out on the newsletter. I'll give you more information. But let's pray, and we will get into our message for today. There is a lot to talk about today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the privilege and the blessing and the opportunity to come together to worship. And Lord, um, whether we are here in person or watching online, um, Lord, my prayer remains the same. Um, that you will hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary, that any and all glory goes back to you and to you alone. I ask that you would open not just our minds, but our hearts as well as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right. We are continuing with our End Times Daniel and Revelation series today. Now, to be perfectly honest... It feels like we've covered a lot, um, and it, at, the, at the same time, it feels like we've barely scratched the surface. You know, I told the worship participants, we're going to try and look into the camera as much as possible, but I like looking at you and uh, communicating here, so online, I'm going to do a bit of both, um, and that's how we'll do it. But I mentioned this before, the traditional, the more conventional Daniel Revelation prophecy sessions, prophecy seminars usually go for about 28 sessions with about an hour each. We've condensed all of that into effectively a seven-part series with about 30 to 40 minutes each. That said, um, today's topic may in some way pique your interest more than others. Today is a continuation of the three angels' message, and uh, specifically we'll be looking at the third angel's message, or more specifically, as you see on the screen, the mark of the beast. You almost need a soundtrack for that, right? The mark of the beast. Dun, dun, dun. To be fair, to be fair, it is a serious topic, and it does have serious repercussions. However, some of the stuff out there that I've seen, not just in recent times, but over the years, all claiming to be the mark of the beast by some, I don't know if I would say well-meaning preachers, I don't know. I heard one preacher uh, try to raise money to buy a new jet and said that, you know, if I don't buy a jet, I'm, it's what's well, because of the mark of the beast. So... It's 4G, it's 5G, now it's the vaccine. What we're going to do today is we're going to break things down a little bit and see what the Bible 
actually says is the mark of the beast. Now, I need to make a very, very important disclaimer before we continue. Today's sermon is not the only one that you... Uh, let, me, let me start again. You cannot just watch today's sermon and go, yeah, look at all the other topics. Yeah, not interested. I'm only interested in this one. I'm just going to watch this one. Today's sermon should not be the only one that you're watching in the series. In fact, I would say that you must watch especially last week's sermon because I set the stage a little and I effectively spoke a little bit about these two guys. I can tell who some of you are looking at me maybe a little bit bewildered. What is he? Yeah, well, I was trying to illustrate essentially that that's both me, okay? My wife loves both of those. That was, not a, that was very affirming, honey. Thank you. <laughs> she wasn't super keen on me growing facial hair because that's the best I can do. The point is, it's both sides of the same coin, not the most, not the most powerful illustration. But the fact is, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, also wrote the book of uh, the Gospel of John with the intent, of course, to reveal Jesus. And that was absolutely clear in the first angel's message, which says this in Revelation 14 and verse 6. It starts off with this. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So it is this everlasting gospel, the good news that John has already highlighted in 21 chapters of the gospel of John, the assumption that if you read Revelation, you should have or must have already read the book of John. So continuing to Revelation 14 and verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water." Now, without repeating the entire sermon, including the semantics of fear and what it actually means, the core of the first angel's message is trust and worship. The first angel invites us to connect and worship with an all-powerful, almighty God, the Jesus, the powerful Jesus that we need as time comes to an end. It is an invitation to tap into an incredible source of power, the omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God. The first angel's message, now we have the second angel's message, which says this, and another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The core of the second angel's message is that, yes, Babylon has done all those things, but no matter what happens... Babylon will fall. Babylon, which symbolically and spiritually represents anything that opposes God, that seeks to replace God. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Oh, Roshani is running away. <laughs> How do we feel about it, right? Here's the problem. Answering these two questions actually require an entire sermon in and of itself. You won't answer these two questions adequately. Well, it just so happens that we actually do have a sermon preached just three months ago that talks about this on August 21st uh, this year as part of our In Defense series. Dan preached specifically about this idea of uh, hell and everlasting fire. That's probably a little bit too small for you to read, but Dan was actually preaching on Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11 as part of the sermon. So I want to encourage you to read, uh, sorry, to watch that sermon. Uh, if you Google, uh, if you go to YouTube, you can search for that. It's in defense of the sermon series part 7. Or if you type in bit.ly slash in defense of part 7 in your browser, that will take you straight to that YouTube page. Um, Dan effectively answers the question of what does it mean in, from our previous slide here. What does it mean with all of these brim, brimstone and hellfire and all that? Because this image does not tie in with the picture of a loving God. Now, um, let me give you the short answer because I don't want to just go watch the sermon and we're going to skip to the next part. Let me give you the short answer. Let me give you the short answer. 
I've already alluded to this in last week's message, but this idea of context and the fact that it's written in symbolic language plays a huge part. Let me illustrate with a couple of very perhaps simplistic illustrations. By the time I'm done with my illustrations today and with this series, you're probably going to be like, you need to step, Yoshi, you need to step up your illustration game. Let me illustrate, okay? If someone were to just jump out at me and just catch me unaware, please don't try it, especially you, Amish. I would probably squeal like a little, squeal like a man, and I would go, you scared the bajabas out of me, right? That's all I would say. Or I would go, mate, I would go, you, would, you scared the shackles out of me, right? Now, very, very important question I'm going to ask you here, very deep, powerful question. Did I lose any bajabas or shackles? Yeah, you're not, you're not, I told you I need to up my illustration game. Let me give you another one. January 15th is Tim's birthday. It is also Tanisha's birthday. Now, if I were to forget that it was, in fact, our anniversary, you would say that my wife would... <laughs> my wife would... The correct answer is forgive me. No, no. You would say she would forgive me, and then she would kill me. There is symbolic language here, um, and the language here is meant to help us understand the severity, the severity of the result of receiving the mark of the beast. So what does it mean? It's trying to point out that there are eternal consequences, essentially an eternal separation from God, and how do we feel about it? John is saying, he's using strong enough language to say, avoid it at all all costs. Whatever you do, do not get the mark of the beast. Do not worship the beast. That's the language it's trying to convey. So when I ask, is anyone excited about reading this? Everyone's like, I don't like this part. I don't even like, you know, chances are you might go, oh, yeah, she's preaching about the mark of the beast. I've heard enough about it. I would rather hear about something else. See, Unfortunately, this third grouping here, the wine of the wrath of God, the eternal fire, the torment, the, the results part, has been the driving factor, the baseline foundation for many preachers when it comes to preaching the mark of the beast. They use this as the basis of the third angel's message as its foundation, when in reality, the most important thing about the third angel's message is actually the other two parts. More specifically, the most important thing is the bookends of the message. The first part, let me bring up the summary screen again. So these are the three parts. We've looked at part three just briefly, but the core of the message is actually the first group, as I mentioned, which bookends the third angel's message, this idea of worship. We'll come back to that. I said um, we're working backwards and perhaps some or many of you are more interested in this second part, right? The beast and his image and referring to or receiving rather the mark. You know, you ask the question, who is the beast? What is the mark? How do we receive it? We have a problem. I have done presentations on the mark of the beast before. And if you really wanted to present a thorough biblical case, we need to expound on Revelation 13, which specifically talks about the beast and the dragon, repeating some of the things that we've read in Revelation 14 with the third angel's message. And then we have to cross-reference it with the little horn in Daniel chapter 7, um, which we haven't touched on yet because they are obvious parallels. So I looked at my notes, my previous presentations on this subject matter all in the context of a traditional Daniel Revelation series, just Daniel 7 alone, I had 176 slides across two one-hour presentations. I like to be thorough. 
That's Daniel 7 only. So when you factor in Revelation 13, and then you kind of have to look at Revelation 17 and 18 as well, all in all, there was well more than 300 or so slides on this topic of the mark of the beast. More than 300. So far, we've had about 27. Some of you who are in church is like, of course, I picked the one day to come to church when Yoshi's going to have 325 sermons, slides. Nobody's horrified by that because you're like, he's not going to take us through 300 slides, is he? Well, I'm not. I'm going to summarize what I have in 300 slides into the next 30 or so, give or take, a few. What this also means is that some things I'm going to gloss over somewhat, it may seem like it, and thereby make a couple of leaps. I'm not going to say jump to conclusions. I, I guess you can say that jumps to conclusions. But I want to assure you that they, for all intents and purposes, are well-informed jumps. And I'm happy to share with you, outside of a church sermon context, how those jumps were made. So to answer these three questions, who is the beast, what is the mark, and how do we receive it? Let's start with a comparison of Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13. Daniel 7 talks about the little horn. Revelation 13 refers to this beast. So I'm just going to click this through, okay? Very, very quickly, the references are there. You can pause if you're watching online and then just catch up if you want to read these verses. But the little horn, he spake great words against the Most High in Daniel 7.25. The beast from the sea spoke great things and blasphemies. The horn made war with the saints. The saints, uh, likewise with the beast. Um, the little horn shall wear out the Most High the saints of the Most High, uh, the, the revelation beast whoa, uh, overcame the saints, um, the little horn greater than his fellows, the beast from the sea power was given over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, they shall be given unto him for a time, times, and half a time, and the beast from the sea power was given to him to continue forty and two months. So we can really break down what each of these mean, and now you can understand why we, you can have 300 slides, but instead of doing that, I'm just going to in fact, I'm going to give you one slide to kind of figure out the correlation, right? So um, the 42 months and the time, times, and times work out to 1,260 days. How does, that, how does that calculate? Well, time, times, and half a time. A time is a year. Times is two years. Uh, by biblical time, is 180 days for half a time, and that works out to 1,260 prophetic days in Revelation 13, verse 5. 42 months, 30 days times 42 equals 1,260 prophetic days. Okay, so there's a lot of this information. I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg. There's about eight verses that talks about this timeline alone, okay? Um, and I'm not going to go into that sort of a detail today, not today. Uh, we can come up with a date. I will tell you it leads to 1798, for example. But I'm just going to skip over it because this is just one identifying mark. In fact, going to this previous slide, all of these set the framework and the foundation for identifying the beast. He spoke great words, blasphemies. He made wars, wore them out, overcame them, killed them. It had great power. So studying all of these and using them as identification marks with cross-references to other parts of Revelation all point towards a religious power that surpasses anything that earth has ever seen. The word blasphemy, according to Webster's Dictionary, it can mean either the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God or the act of claiming the attributes of deity. It is with this definition in mind and a number of others, and all those things paralleled in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, that many theologians have also called this beast, the little horn, the Antichrist. Anti meaning in place of, as in someone who would take the position of Christ. So this is where the jumping conclusion, conclusion jumping, is happening a, quick, a little bit quicker than where I would normally go. So putting all of this together, this is the conclusion of a number of theologians, according to George Ladd. 
Many of the great Christians of Reformation and post-Reformation times share this view of prophetic truth and that identified the Antichrist with the Roman papacy. Among adherents of this interpretation were the Waldenses, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Melanchthon, Tyndale, Latimer, and Ridley. R.A. Anderson um, says this in the book on Folding Daniel's prophecies. Leaders such as Luther, Calvin, Knox, and Cranmer pointed to Daniel 7 and Revelation 17, identifying the great apostasy with headquarters in Rome. The scriptural message of Revelation 18, verse 4, again, you'll have to read that for yourself, <clears throat> formed the basis of many of their sermons. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. John Wycliffe who was an English scholastic philosopher, theologian, biblical translator, reformer, priest, and a seminary professor at the University of Oxford. He was actually in the Roman Catholic priesthood. This is what he says. The Pope is Antichrist here on earth. Yo, that's intense, bro. Like, say what? Some of you are watching this. It's like, wait, wait. I used to like you, Yoshi. But I have Catholic friends and family. They are the loveliest people. Are you saying that worshipping the beast and they have the mark of the beast because they are Catholic? No. Now, firstly, um... I'm only telling you what the reformers from the 15th, 16th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century came. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But I want to be absolutely clear, because I don't want you to take my words out of context, right? I believe with all my heart there will be plenty of Catholics in heaven, without a doubt. I can talk about that a little bit more, but I want to take a slight detour for just a moment. And I feel like as a pastor, on behalf of pastors, I almost have to apologize when we get up here and we take this you know, judgmental finger and point at people and say that we're better than you. I'm very confident in saying that there will be plenty of Catholics in heaven when Jesus comes again. I'm also very confident in saying that there will be plenty of Seventh-day Adventists who will not make it to heaven. Here's why I can be so confident in making those bold declarations. Because at the end of time, you will only have two choices. It's not choosing between the Seventh-day Adventist church or the Catholic church or any other church. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor for a very good reason. And I invite you and, and make sure, I, I want you to come to our church. I believe that we have a prerogative, a mission to preach Jesus and his soon coming, the three angels message in its right context. But at the end of time, there are only two choices. You either choose to worship God or you don't. And that's why John uses these strong language to get your attention. It's the reason why Wycliffe and Luther and all these reformers, they are all Catholics, by the way. The reason why the biblical interpretation of these reformers so clearly point towards their own church is because of all these factors that we've touched on. Um, and these things here, we've just barely scratched the surface, they lived through a time when the church of the Middle Ages committed these atrocities against the saints. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. The church killed and killed a lot. There's no separation of church and state. They were one, and they did as they pleased. But I need to remind all of you here listening and watching one very important fact. As I said, sometimes, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, we're quick to point fingers, oh, those Roman Catholics. Those of you who have Catholic friends and family will think very differently. But remember this, as far as Christianity is concerned, the Catholic Church is actually part of our legacy. 
To simply call it, to simply separate us from the Roman Catholic Church is misleading because for a thousand years, there weren't any denominations. You go to Turkey, which have suffered because of the Crusades, and you try and separate yourself as a Christian from what happened during that time. In some ways, it's still our heritage And in many ways, God has used this church in spite of, you know, its schools, its schools, monetaries, hospitals, missionaries, all have contributed greatly to the advancement and pastoral care of the world. When we talk about the church of the dark ages, especially to non-Christians, it's almost as if we are looking at a mirror in some ways, and we tend to forget that. We cannot move away from the fact, though, that this church, as prophesied in the Bible, has committed these crimes. That's a historically, biblically prophesied fact. But most importantly, I have to repeat this again, I'm not trying to attack or build up prejudice because it's vital to remember that prophecy is about an organization a system of theology, and not about individuals, which brings us back to this question. Who is the beast? Well, the Reformers identified the papacy as this beast. The next question, what is the mark? <laughs> I looked at my traditional Adventist interpretation, or uh, even you, well, I looked at my traditional Adventist presentation viewpoint. I'm going to skip to a conclusion here. You can clearly say that the mark of the beast is the stamp of authority by the beast power, and it is centered around its authority to change times, to change laws, to basically do as it pleases. The mark of the beast is when spiritual authority, spiritual power is exercised as if it was acting as God on earth. The mark of the beast comes into play when you are persecuted because you do not want to follow in its image when you make a choice to choose God. I've heard all sorts of conclusions describing what the mark of the beast is, from the vaccine to 5G to Bill Gates and even Barney the cute purple dinosaur. I saw it on the internet, so it must be true. A very simple test on whether something is the mark of the beast or not is simply this. Are you worshipping something or someone other than God? Or more specifically, is someone's authority or power stopping you from having a direct relationship with God? Is whatever system in place such that you can only go through God through this system. Now, you're starting to draw, wait, wait, what's the parallel with a few things that are happening here? Hang on. Before you jump to that conclusion, stay with me. The mark of the beast, as described in Revelation 13 and verse 6, on your right hand and on your forehead, is a declaration of allegiance to a particular system of worship and spiritual power that sees itself as having all authority on this earth. Let me say that again. I wrote this down because I want you to be absolutely clear in what I'm saying here. The mark of the beast, it's a declaration of allegiance to a particular system of worship and spiritual power that sees itself as having all authority on this earth. Many akin the mark of the beast to Sunday law. I told Nadia, I was like, should I talk about Sunday law? Well, it's out there. So I'd rather you hear it from me and hear my perspective. I don't think people understand what the Sunday law is. I have heard, in fact, growing up from preachers, they say that the Sunday law is when you worship on Sunday. Listen to me. It's okay to worship on Sunday. Now, before you go, what kind of a Seventh-day Adventist pastor are you? The kind that encourages you and wants you to worship God every day of the week, including Sunday. 
The Sunday law is actually a time when we cannot worship any day of the week, like today as the Sabbath, but on Sunday only. That is a clear distinction that we must make. Because every time somebody goes, oh, you worship on Sunday? Well, you, I was like, I worship every, every day of the week, thank you very much. The Sunday law is not simply worshiping on Sunday, it's worshiping on Sunday only. The way I see it, it's a system that would, in theory, not allow worship on any other day of the week, definitely not today, and we have no choice to follow. It is a system that strips you from having a personal, direct connection with God. The mark of the beast comes into play when you can no longer have a direct connection with God. And that is exactly what happened in the Dark Ages, and I believe that's exactly what will happen again. The people in the Middle Ages had no direct connection with God. Everything had to come through the priest, things like forgiveness, things like uh, everything, everything. If any system is created that stops you from doing that, where you have the ultimate choice to choose to follow this system or to choose to follow God, that's the mark of the beast, effectively. There's some correlation to Sunday law and all that, but beyond that, it is primarily an issue of worship, which now takes us to the final part of our sermon and also the first grouping from our three angels' message, right? From our third angels' message, rather. We're going to talk about part one as our final part. You know, I can see everyone who's watching, um, and I think we get around, I don't know, a couple of hundred views each uh, uh, live stream. Um, which I'm assuming translates to about five to 600 people as some have multiple people watching on screen, on the one screen. I imagine at least a few of your ears kind of perked up when I said, oh, he's talking about Sunday law. But you might have also gone, wait, 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 you didn't go into it more, more like you need to go into it more. Tell us, what does it look like? Um, and you're going to go into our final part already? Well, on one hand, it's partially a time thing but the reason why I've decided to spend less time this time, cut down 300 slides to effectively 25, and I probably will spend even less time on it in the future. Let me put it this way. Here's why. I'm coming into my 11th year as a pastor. I've been a seven-day Adventist Christian for 25 years, 26 years, something like that, 27 years. Um... And I've worked in IT for about three quarters of, um, three quarters, well, not three quarters of my life. Sometimes it feels like it. Here's what I come to realize. We tend to focus on the wrong thing. As a church, as a denomination, a large part of our prophetic interpretation has been about avoiding something. Like, knowing what to avoid is the solution to being ready for the end times. What do I mean? When we come to Daniel and Revelation, we often spend so much time trying to identify falsehood than we do in learning truth. I said, I have 300 slides that, that is designed to tell you about the Pope and all that. When was the last time I had 300 slides telling you about Jesus? The reality of this, of how we approach prophecy, is, set, is settling my mind as I prepare this series. I certainly don't shy away from it, and I won't. But here's how I see it. You may think I'm going on a tangent, but stay with me. There's a purpose and a reason for this. Before I got married, and I have permission to share this, now they have to step out. It's not timed. <laughs> before, we got mar- before I got married, before we got married, I had a number of relationships. I I did tell her that I was going to share this, and she said, go ahead. You're like, what what has this got to do with anything? Stay with me. When I was looking for the person that was for me, I didn't go out looking for girls that I would avoid. Okay? I know it's confusing. Let, let Let me clarify. I wasn't out looking for what wasn't right for me, 
Now, I, 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 so I know what to avoid. That wasn't where my eyes was at. My focus was on finding who was right. My focus wasn't on avoiding who was wrong. We're talking about you now, honey. Oh, talking about me. I didn't get to know girls with a list. I didn't go into a date and go, do not date if, you know. It wasn't about avoiding the wrong girl, and our red flags came up. Of course, I paid attention. But instead of watching, spending all my time on red flags, I spent my time figuring out what was right for me. So when Nadia came into my life, I didn't go, oh, well, this is what I don't want. Please, God, help her not to have any of these characteristics. That was my focus for a little while in some ways. It was quite the opposite. I knew what I wanted. I knew what was right. And I'll never forget that day. Five weeks after our first phone conversation, I told my mom, she's the one. She's the one. I don't tell you about how great my marriage is by telling you about all the bad relationships that I've been able to avoid. I guess I mention them every now and then. I don't go, our marriage is great because unlike the time when I was dating Susie, (laughs) you know, we don't have that. Sure, it has crossed my mind. But I talk about my wife like it's the greatest thing to ever happen to me, so much so that some of you are probably sick of it, to which is say, Yoshi, you really need to work on your illustration game because you can't stop talking about her and your marriage in every single illustration, and you are right, and I apologize, sort of. But maybe, Maybe, just maybe, we need to take this approach to Christianity. Maybe instead of talking so much about the beast, the mark of the beast, we need to talk more about Jesus. Sometimes I receive so much about the beast and the mark of the beast and all the... And, and the I'm tempted to almost ask them, are you following Jesus or are you following the Pope? Because at the end of the day... It doesn't matter whether we're able to fully figure out the mark of the beast or the number or or when you can buy or sell or whatever. The only segment in the third angel's message that we really should focus and spend all our time on is this first part, who are we going to worship? Where is our focus? That's why it bookends the third angel's message, the solution, the answer, if you must, to this third angel's message is found in the very next verse, Revelation 14 and verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. You could make the argument that this is the concluding part of the three angels' message, because the angel's like, yeah, yeah, sure, I've told you not to worship the beast, blah, 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 instead. But instead, you know, what you really should do, let me just leave you with the final word, do this. Obey God's commandments, but most importantly, remain faithful to Jesus. Here's how you don't get the mark of the beast. Not by focusing on it and not by watching out for it. But you don't get the mark of the beast by focusing on Jesus Jesus and remaining faithful to Him. So instead of spending our time figuring out what the devil is going to do, Let's spend our time in understanding what God calls us to do, to obey Him, to remain faithful to Him. Focus on what you can, not on what you can't. So in summary, let me bring this all together. First angel is about trust and worship. The second angel's message is about victory and hope. And the third angel's message effectively is about choice and focus. As I invite the praise and worship team to come up. Let me say this final thing. The three angels' message is a triumphant one. 
It's about what happens at the end of time when we have to make a choice. And it's a choice that begins today. Yes, we exercise trust. We choose our focus. We make our choice to worship. We cling on to victory and hope. All those things set us up for this grand finale. The main purpose of the three angels' message and the main purpose of the book of Revelation is so that we'll be ready when he comes in the clouds of glory. And that should be our focus. That should be our focus. That should be what drives us. That should be what takes up our time. Oh, it's in our name, Adventist. Fancy that. I invite you to sing with us this glorious day when Jesus comes again in the clouds of glory as we sing Days of Elijah.